Hopefully everybody can hear me. I can hear my own voice though. I tend to get quiet as time goes on, so just let me know. Um, so yes, that was a very nice introduction. Thank you. Um, so my name is Kelly Jones, and I have worked at Atrium Healthcare. Uh, we're going through the name changes here, which has been somewhat interesting, especially from a technology perspective, just rebranding everything you can think of. Um, I've been with Atrium now full-time for five years. I was a consultant for a couple of years prior to that, uh, before going native. I've got close to 20 years experience, which is hard for me to believe, but 10 plus in SharePoint in particular. Uh, I do have a blog, it's rather quiet, and my Twitter feed tends to be quiet, uh, except for college football on Saturday. So if you're not an Ohio State fan, you'll probably find me annoying. Ooh, go Buckeyes! Go Blue! Go Blue. All right, <clears throat> so why this presentation? So this is something I've given for the last couple of years. Because uh, I attend a lot of lectures on Saturdays, user groups, and different things. And a lot of the presentations that you get are um, typically from consulting uh, world, which I do have a background in that. And it, it typically from a consultant's view, they, they come in and they install something and then they kind of move on to the next project. Uh, whereas this presentation is much more of a, what I consider a little bit more rare in that it's the ongoing experience that we've had at Atrium. So it's five plus years now. Uh, so it's our lessons learned. Um, all kinds of information just from our experience. Uh, but I want to go through real quick what Atrium is and then go through all of our migration to Office 365, focusing on the challenges that you may or may not hear um, otherwise. So why the presentation, like I said, I like to hear real world examples when I go to events like this. So I thought, well, that's, that's easy for me to speak to because I'm just telling the story that we, we've kind of lived through for the last few years. I also feel like it's some practical advice some things that you won't know until kind of after the fact of going through something like this. Uh, a little bit beyond the sales demo where everything is perfect and all, every you know, active directory is just right on with all the data accurate, right? All of our APs. Um, but, you know, this is my get out jail free card right here. Uh, is the way we do things perfect? No. Uh, but your mileage may vary. Hopefully, you will find some things useful though, on what I share tonight. So, what is Atrium Health? Like they were saying we have 60,000, we call them teammates, team members, uh, with one of the one of the largest public not-for-profit not healthcare systems. Uh, you can see we've got some very big members. We're over two states uh, looking to move in to a third state. Uh, we're in negotiations with a hospital system down in Georgia. Uh, but imagine, you know, it's 40 hospitals, 900 care locations. Big, big system. Uh, this kind of shows where we're spread out over the Carolinas. So all over. The key thing here is to remember how large we are when I start talking here in a little bit about where we start. All right, so the Office 365 decision. So before Office 365, uh, I got the story, this was before I started, uh, and around December of 2007, for SharePoint, there was one server. They are kind of excited because it was free. It was WSS 3.0 for those of you SharePoint folks. Uh, that's the, the one that you can download. In fact, when I talked to the, the server admin that installed it, he was planning on installing Gibbs 2.0. When he went out to download it, he discovered that 3 was available, so that's what he did. So I'll point that out is that was the entire planning of their SharePoint installation. Right? Was that one five seconds? He chose the 3.0. Uh, anyways, they went from that one server. Uh, by July 2011, we had upgraded to a three-server farm, uh, and they had 70 web applications, which the Microsoft documentation, right, because it's some SharePoint folks probably crinkling your nose at that, like 70. I was doing the same thing. I thought, when I was talking to them, because this was about when I came, um, <clears throat> I thought that was, somebody didn't know their SharePoint would go. I, you know, they were talking sites or some other thing in SharePoint. But very much surprising to me, it was 70 web applications in SharePoint which the Microsoft documentation for 2010 said, don't do more than 10. In fact, if you do more than I mean, two or something, you're doing it wrong. So they had seven, so there were some things to learn. Uh, by July of 2013, we had upgraded to a SharePoint 2010 farm. We got uh, some funding at that point, uh, some backing from the CIO. So we had a 13 server farm, truly robust for as large an organization as we would. Uh, but really it took 
that six years to get from that point. So it was kind of surprising we had just moved to this very big server farm on prem. It was 2010, SQL 2012, and we had um, even figured out the, uh, it was new to SQL at the time, it was database mirroring, and I think was the, or always on, SQL always on, it was brand new in 2012. We even had that, that up and running, so we had offsite uh, disaster recovery. Um, we had spent all this time, and then all of a sudden, leadership decided we're going to go to Office 365. We just got done migrating everything to this brand new form. Um, but when they were doing the cost justification, they really only did the math on exchange. It was, uh, we had so much exchange on premise that when they decided to go to 365, the only reason, the only math they had to do was the exchange part. SharePoint was essentially free at that point. We were so small. We only had 400 gigabytes of storage uh, in use. Uh, compare that with our home directories. So for us, that's an F drive. It might be an H drive or something for you. Uh, where we have like 75 terabytes. Uh, file shares for departmental like, file shares, another 75 terabytes. So this 400 gigabytes of SharePoint is nothing. Uh, and adoption was, was pretty low at that point. We had just installed a new farm. We had spent all this time just kind of moving things behind the scenes and haven't really engaged our end users yet. So one of the first decisions we had to make <clears throat> was whether we were going to have a hybrid SharePoint environment. And there's a couple of things that kind of play into this for us in particular. Um, we decided not to do hybrid. And one of the reasons is because we had this history of just WSS, where there wasn't a lot of features in WSS that weren't in SharePoint online at that point. Uh, we didn't have a lot of integration with uh, other systems like any kind of BI stuff going on. We had a separate data warehouse and they had their own features and uh, things like uh, business objects and Tableau and other reporting systems. So we really weren't leveraging SharePoint for that. And, and it kind of kills me to say this, but SharePoint was really used as a glorified file share. Right? Yeah, kind of used to that. Um, it's probably safe to say 99% of it was just simply to store files and retrieve them. Uh, so, you know, moving that to SharePoint Online was kind of a no-brainer. Uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, the other thing that we had here in our thinking was, at this point, we had, had consultants filling the role of what would be a SharePoint admin, SharePoint server admin, somebody who would uh, install the, the operating system in uh, SharePoint and work with the SQL team to do all the configuration and do all that type of work that just kind of keeps the lights on that, the installation of patches, all that type of stuff. Um, you know, our thinking was that if we went to SharePoint Online, we wouldn't necessarily need that role. That was one, one of the cost savings. Because SharePoint skills, especially at that time, were pretty hard to find, and pretty expensive once you did find them. So this is what it looked like when we were migrating to SharePoint Online. We had 400 plus site collections. Um, and in those 400 site collections were about 7,000 subsites, and it was 400 gigabytes, and that was not evenly distributed. Some of them were quite large, and some of them were a lot more small. Um, one of the first things that we did as part of our process was reach out to our site owners and ask them if they're even still using the site, if we need to bother moving it. Uh, and that's how we went from 400 plus down to 330 actually being moved. So we trimmed you know, almost a quarter of a month without having to worry about it. But in the meantime, it took us a while, so the, the data size of those 330 had increased to 500 gigs over that time. So some of the biggest challenges <clears throat> that we had are, you know, I kind of organized it around these big three topics. Uh, essentially getting our environment ready for Office 365, uh, figuring out how we were going to handle the change that was happening, and the ongoing change that you see with these uh, online services. And then end user adoption, uh, how are we going to get people to use it after making this, this move and this investment. So we started in spring of 2013, that's when the leadership made a decision to go to Office 365. The contract was signed about uh, around, you know, around the end of my so this would be the secret to getting investing. Uh, it was kind of funny because I, and I remember this at the time, the estimate was it's going to take about six months to get Exchange and SharePoint and everything moved. Uh, so by the end of the calendar year, you should be all done. Uh, it'll be funnier once I tell you the real dates. But, um, 
that fall is really when it kicked in when we started um, just getting the first things going. Like we had ADFS, so we would log in. The tenant was spun up, probably that was the first step that summer at some point. Uh, but we had an ADFS login process. Uh, we, on you know, the SharePoint team, had selected our tool that we were going to use to migrate our sites. Uh, that was MetaDivis, and now owned by MetaLogics. A lot of consolidation. Um, but really, I'd like to point out that that is the time when the IS teams really started to get, dig into the details of how this stuff was really going to work or not work in some cases with our environment. So by January, we were ready to start piloting, not done with our migration. Uh, they, we had some exchange mailboxes moved, uh, we focused on moving those belongings into our uh, Office 365 teams within IS. So at the time, we had uh, a separate uh, what we call our collaboration team, which they did Active Directory, the Exchange, and uh, Skype. Or Skype for business, I should say. Uh, we had a separate SharePoint team, which is one that I was on, so it was SharePoint and OneDrive. Uh, we covered Yammer, we kind of shared that responsibility with, with another team. Um, but our teams started to use uh, Exchange Online for our email. Uh, we also started to use SharePoint Online sites. Uh, and what we did is, when anybody would request a new SharePoint site, and the way we do that is, you request it, what really what you're requesting is a site collection. So if somebody would request a new site collection, we would ask them, uh, you know, you've got this new SharePoint, would you, would you rather have it or the traditional? And, you know, we get about, we average between 15 to 20 of those requests a month uh, for new site collections. And I think there was only one team that said, no, we want the old stuff instead of the new stuff that year. Which was kind of funny because they had to move it later, so we just need to do some pain. Uh, but anyway, so we got the pilots rolling. Uh, this is the, uh, the timeline. So you can kind of see I broke it out. Uh, there was this gap. So I said in January we started rolling out the pilots, right? Um, and that's Really, if you look at this, I'm not, January is not even on this graph. There's this gap between January and September, and then really the migrations in earnest started in April. We spiked and we, we did a bunch of little sites to begin with, ones that were less complex. Uh, and then as time went on, we had some very complicated outliers towards the end. But we got the bulk of them done over probably a six month time. Uh, so, really, the migration were far from done uh, until the end of 2015, we say to say, and mostly done. Um, the exchange mailboxes, by the way, they follow a similar trajectory. Uh, January to May of 2015, the bulk of their mailboxes were moved. And then it wasn't until December of 2016 that the final 7,000 was done. It was kind of funny at the rate uh, that we were going, the exchange team thought they were going to beat the SharePoint team, getting everything moved. Uh, but then the SharePoint team ended up finishing six months ahead of the exchange team. I'm happy about that. That was June of 2016. So, you know, I tell the story because, you know, there's this incredible gap, right, of starting in January of 2014 with our pilot, really not being completed until June of 2016 with our final migration. So there was a huge gap. So what happened to 2014? Well, we ran into a bunch of technical issues. So we had to pull the brakes. It was during this pilot that we really started to learn what we needed to know. Um, and one of the first things was to look at our desktop configuration. These were the two uh, primary desktop configs we had out there. We still have Windows XP. Uh, we were all proud that we had just finished deploying IE8, I think, 13 or 14. Um, Office 2010 was on a lot of those XP machines. Office 2013 was our standard image on Windows 7, uh, but it still was IE8. And you know, when we signed the contract with Microsoft, but they had the announcement out by then that support for IE8 would end in April of 2014. I don't know if that really didn't sink in at first. But they were going to actually do that. So that was one of the first things we had to deal with, was the end of support for IE8. And, and the way they you know, they were very upfront that they were going to end support, but that didn't mean it was going to stop functioning that day, right? Uh, instead, what happened was little things started to break. 
and it wasn't things that Microsoft was ever going to fix. So it could be, you know, maybe things looked a little strange layout wise because it was using uh, something new with CSS that I used to support. Uh, Microsoft was just literally not testing. That's what they mean when they don't support it, right? They're not testing out of um, By June of that year, uh, it turns out that to use Outlook Web Access or Webmail, um, you had to use uh, either a different browser, a newer browser, or if you're using IE8, you were going to get the light version. Has anybody ever seen the light version of Web Access? Right? It's, it's pretty light. Yeah, <laughs> But you know, that's what it's designed for. It's designed for compatibility with over browsers with low bandwidth. So, so it turns out that IE8 was getting to be this death by a thousand paper cuts. It was really our first, I would say, our first real lesson that we're on this train now and we have to start upgrading at a pace that we may have never thought we had to. Now, unfortunately for Microsoft, the way we solved it at the time, because there was no way we were going to upgrade all of our applications that required IE8, uh, we solved it by installing a Chrome. And, and in fact, it was kind of funny when we go to deploy Chrome on our computers, we found out it was already on 13,000 machines, so IS just finished the deployment. Uh, put it on the rest. Um, and the, you know, one of the things that we did for Chrome was that we said that there was no application that could ever impose that it was going to be a certain version of Chrome. Chrome, we were just going to let it update the way Google pushes out updates. Uh, we don't even really see a blip on our network when they do that. Uh, we noticed that. I think, you know, talking about the desktop team, I think they see the majority of those machines are updated within about a week or so for Chrome update going off to do it. Yeah. So you were allowing user installs for Chrome? We were, uh, but now it's, it's deployed and so. And you're not managing it like group policies? We are. Yeah. There's group policy in there. It, it does some of the configuration that's on the home page. Um, but it's pretty minimal touch. Uh, we didn't want to get back to a corner because IE8, one of the things you know, because it can be so configured, is that we had, every time some application would break with IE8, we would tweak IE8 to work with that app, and lo and behold, we were holding ourselves back, and that could be things like the TLS versions, right? You configure the browser to, oh no, don't use the newer TLS, you gotta stick to the old stuff to make the old apps work. At a certain point, that catches up with you. Yeah, so we didn't want that to happen in Chrome. Not that you have nearly the control over Chrome that you do with IE anyway. Another question? Um, you know, and we thought that we were very clever in this. You know, obviously our users kind of liked Chrome; they, they were installing it anyways. Um, but one of the things that happened with that is that when we pushed out Chrome, people got confused about this browser thing. They, it turns out they didn't really care if, what browser was IE or what was Chrome. In fact, I, I still remember I was in front of a group uh, or one of our uh, nurse managers group or something. And I'm talking, I'm getting ready to go up in front of them, they're having like an offsite or something. I'm getting ready to talk to them about you know, Office 365, just kind of an introduction to it. And one of the ladies is very upset. And she was upset because Office 365 had broken Chronos. Chronos is our timekeeping web application. So I was very puzzled. I was like, what do you mean it broke Chronos? I'm like, how? Well, she said, well, that, that Office 365 icon on my desktop that I have to use for all my web apps now. Of Google Chrome. She was calling that Office 365. So when she heard us say, or what, when, when we said, please use Chrome for web apps for Office 365, what she heard was, don't ever use IE8 again because it's broken. Always use Chrome. So there was a lot of confusion in there. That was kind of a highlight to me, really. Like the, so we did some things to, to solve that, too. Um, by the way, we've since deployed IE11 to all workstations. Chrome is still out there. People have the option of using either one. As we roll out Windows 10, now they have the option to use Edge as well, uh, which it's mostly the same compatibility as Chrome. All right, another issue that we're going to get into, and I don't know if this is unique necessarily to the hospital scenarios, but uh, we have something that we call shared workstations or auto login PCs. If you think when you go, you go visit one of our physicians or something, and you go into like a clinical area where there's a computer mounted to the wall or something. Uh, if you ever notice, the next time you visit some physician's office, just watch, you will not see them logging in and out of Windows because that would add how many minutes to, to your exam, right? Uh, instead, what they do is they walk up and they kind of unlock the computer or something, and then there's um, they log into applications. 
their computers actually logged in as a Windows identity, and that's what we call these generic identities. Well, what happens is when you go to, uh, say, SharePoint or anything online on our Office 365, where we try to automatically log you in so that you're not prompted all the time for a password. All of a sudden, it's trying to log in as that generic identity. For us, it's the name of the computer, you know, something like PC123. Well, guess what? PC123 doesn't have a license because we're not going to buy a license for all those. So people get these very strange errors about not having a license. You know, you know the Office 365 page has got this no license thing. Um, so, it, and in fact, it really wasn't a thing with SharePoint 2010 because 2010 on-prem had this option to sign in as a different user. So we could set it up so that this generic identity could have basic access to some things and then if they needed to do something else they could just go up to the top and click sign in as a different user. That option isn't there with SharePoint Online. It requires you to get logged in as a person with a license. So it really came down to the integrated authentication, which is that um, login that's silent, right? When you click, you're not prompted, uh, versus these shared workstations. Uh, so the way that we did this was kind of a two-pronged approach. Uh, one, we coached all of our users, and instead of going directly to Office 365 or something like that, they go to our intranet, which is another platform. For us, it's called People Connect, but you can imagine it's just the, the page, the intranet that says your home page. On that page is a link to Office 365. So we, we coach them just go to, just open up the web browser, page that opens up, go to the spot, and click Office 365. That link has some smarts built into it. So it does two things. It's going to check your browser version. So if it's an older browser or it's something that's not compatible, it'll stop and say, please don't use Chrome. Uh, the other thing it does is something called a smart link. And really what this is, and this is a Microsoft defined thing you go out. But if you want to look for it, just search for smart links for ADFS. It's the secret of brand performing. Uh, but really, it's just a query string that you pass in. And you can force, uh, instead of auto login, to stop and ask for any of the password instead. So it's, it's very nice. You can, so we just do this little logic on our intranet. If you're a generic uh, identity, it uses the smart link that forces a login prompt. If you're not generic, then it just logs you in and you can integrate it off, so you're not prompted. So it's kind of the best of both worlds for us. It also catches that browser thing too, so that I don't have to hear about Chronos being broken. Yes. Are you still doing that to this day? We are. We are. Um, well, so we have. We don't. We try not to store PCI data in Office 365. Um, so we don't have, uh, and we have DLP, and I'll get into that too. So we, we block that as much as we can. But it's still, I'm not quite sure beyond that, like the auto login. I just generic logins. Oh, yeah, the generic logins wouldn't have any access to any of that data. Yeah. Yeah, when we're going through where I work, we want to do that audit. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and some other things that yeah, it gets yeah, it gets to be very bad. The uh, the other place where we found it is with the office products, the desktop apps, which were traditionally just deployed on every machine. Well, now with our Office 365 Pro Plus, we have to log into those desktop apps. And there's no really easy way to coach people to log out. They're never going to do that, right? Um, we found that we just had to remove those apps from those computers. Uh, and then all of a sudden some, some things started coming out of the woodwork. Like, oh, well, these nurses were keeping a, a spreadsheet of something important on the desktop on that computer sitting at that nurse's station, which by the way is just generic login. So once we took the office apps off, that's when they had to call out to IS to, hey, this file doesn't open anymore. We're like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? You're storing this just on the desktop? So, so that kind of helped, but it was a little painful to get through that. But I don't know that we've ever really, really known that that type of activity was going on. Yeah. We didn't sign that one. We kind of went to a single sign-on application. So we used Opta. Ah, yeah. Opta, and it combined everything with Office 365 as well as many other applications. So you go there and authenticate it. It doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. <coughs> 
think we looked at some of those those technologies because you'll see uh, oh, we've got I don't know it's not a card thing. There's in some of our clinical areas there's a quicker way to sign in. Um, I forget what the gadget is that they use. Okay. I don't think it was a fingerprint or anything. I'm not sure it was a card or something. So the next thing that we ran, we ran into was file synchronization. So how many people have ever worked with the OneDrive desktop app or the, the sync client, the synchronized file? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of funny given back in time, but prior to around, Microsoft really did a lot of work to fix this in late 2015, which it's hard to believe that that was almost three years ago. So prior to that, they had an older version, uh, and it actually I think is called OneDrive for Business. The name of that app. Uh, under the under the scenes, you could see it. It was listed in Task Scheduler or, uh, before whatever that was. We had Groove.exe. This is an older version, and it goes way back to the Groove stuff that Microsoft bought uh, with, with Ray Ozzy. Uh, anyways, that uh, that older desktop sync client, uh, there was no way for you to enforce really any kind of controls over over that system. So things like uh, you couldn't require that the computer that the files were synced to was and had an encrypted hard drive. Um, you couldn't even require that the computers were company-owned assets versus personally owned. Uh, so things like we had scenarios where somebody could just go home, install that app, synchronize all their OneDrive or any SharePoint data down to that personal computer, and then let's say they get fired or they leave the company for some reason. Up, their user account is disabled at that point, but they have an exact copy of everything on that home computer up to that point. Um, and even if you're still an employee in good standing, maybe you put the computer away, you donate it to a church or something without properly cleaning the hard drive or whatever, all of a sudden you've got data out of the wild but, uh, without your control. So one of the things that we did early on um, was, that I think around 2014, when we had this year kind of reset our compliance of we built a custom solution to go through and disable uh, the OneDrive, or it was called uh, the offline client availability. It's a setting on each and every library in every single SharePoint site and OneDrive site. So this thing would run constantly, just looping through. Because people would create new ones, or maybe they'd go in there and change the setting. Your site owner, you have access to do that. So we would just loop through and turn it off constantly, trying to prevent uh, people from using the little client. All that was solved, though, that fall, <clears throat> because Microsoft did a couple of things. One, they introduced a new client that works remarkably better, um, but it also comes with some controls built into it. So you can do things like limit uh, the computers that the sync client is syncing files to. So we can go in there, and, and it's really a whitelist of Active Directory domains. So we went in there and put our uh, AD domain in, and it's enforced at the Office 365 tenant. So when the OneDrive sync client checks in, it'll see, oh, I, the computer I'm running on has to be in this AD domain. If it's not, it won't, it won't let you sync. So that, that gets rid of all the home computer potential usage. And then if you couple that with our group policies or whatever you require, uh, encrypted hard drives, especially on laptops and things, uh, then really that makes it a, a safe alternative that you can use it. Uh, one side benefit, or one, I shouldn't say benefit, one side effect with this. Max can't join the domain, at least in the definition of the, this stuff. So we had the only other option that you had for Mac is whether you're allow it or not. So we had to turn it off because there's no way for us to differentiate between a company-owned Mac and a personal Mac. Yeah, so I've had I've had some of our internal Mac users come up to me and they really want to use the sync client. They asked what they could do, and I said, well, uh, you could upgrade both Windows machines. <laughs> Time and cheap, but, but really, there's, there's no reason to use the Mac for the personal preference. So, uh, they prefer not to use the address. Um, Could they still open up individual files? They just could use the same 
Yeah, yeah, they can still get to all these files. Now, the Macs are, are very compatible. It's just kind of one nuance when you're trying to control the same client. Uh, in fact, the, at Ignite just a couple of weeks ago, they announced that the, the new sync client from the Mac would do even um, files on demand. So, and that's a, that's a very nice feature to have. So you're not syncing everything. It's just it's like shortcuts or aliases. Really, it takes up minimal space to use the files. But that feature came with the Mac this year. Um, yeah, it's just too bad we can differentiate between company and Mac and not. Um, the other thing too that Microsoft did uh, with this new sync client. And this was another thing that I was, was kind of a sticking point for me. The previous client was had a really bad reputation for the user experience. Uh, it was very buggy. Uh, you would often have to just if you go Google it, you would see all these complaints. Um, but really, they, they fixed that quite a bit. With, uh, but what what I like to point out is that at a night May of 2015, there was a video where they were introduced to the new method that they were one direct client, uh, and the Microsoft. PM or whoever was up on stage, uh, the poor soul had to apologize, and he goes on for like five minutes about how bad the previous client was. Uh, things were fixed really well. Uh, this year, we finally enabled the OneDrive Sync client. So we did that in January. Uh, and I checked today, and that's, these numbers come from today. So we have about 1,600 teammates that are actively using it. Uh, and, and we have three people as of today that are syncing more than 50,000 files. Uh, Quite sure how that would work, but they've got to do it. Uh, this was a lesson learned as part of this, uh, I would say, transition away from file shares and file explorer to a website like OneDrive or SharePoint to access your files. Um, early on, we didn't have a sync plan, right? People still wanted that kind of file explorer uh, interaction with their files. So what they would use is something called Explorer View in SharePoint. OneDrive has it. And it seems like it's a really attractive alternative. It looks like, uh, you know, you're just working with your files. But the thing to understand is underneath it is not using uh, the SMB protocols to talk to a file share like normal. It uses WebDAV, so that's a disconnected thing, different protocol. So it behaves different in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the things that only works by E, so that was kind of, you know, tough the way an IE8. So you launch IE8 and have to get to that point where you can launch the Explorer view. Um, but one, uh, one example we had was well, one of our users went out and they seriously messed up their SharePoint site. Because when you use that Explorer view, it doesn't protect you from, say, deleting files or moving things that are important to SharePoint. So what they had done is they mapped a drive to what they thought was their document library, but instead they mapped it one level up to the root of the SharePoint site. And when they opened that, they saw all these other folders and stuff, and that, and that irritated them. So like, oh, oh, I didn't clean that up. Oh, oh. So luckily, they didn't delete the files. They created a folder called Files I Don't Need and moved it down there. And then when they went to visit their SharePoint site, it said, what's the file I'm on, 404 or something, right? So they opened up a support ticket, and I'm like, I don't know, what did you do? You know, the web page wasn't even. So you know, we figured it out. We were able to get in there, map the drive, and luckily they had it, so we could just move the stuff back to where it was, and it worked. But it points out that you know, this is it really is not necessarily a good alternative because you that SharePoint stuff is very important to a lot of people. They could have been down for how how long? Uh, the other thing too is that using that Explorer, you don't change work habits. So features in SharePoint and OneDrive, like version history and um, being able to share links instead of a traditional attachments to collaborate on documents. And all this other stuff that you give a SharePoint and OneDrive, you don't get that if you're using just the Explorer view. You know, you, you're hanging on to this 1990s or older way of working with files. So, so we were trying to break that habit to, to take advantage of the new functionality too. Great. External sharing. Uh, is anybody using SharePoint and OneDrive with external sharing today? So external sharing, then that's that's where you are sharing or allowing people outside your company to come into your SharePoint or OneDrive site. Let's set it that way. Um, this is actually pretty key for us to allow uh, other companies, either partners, uh, consultants, uh, you know, any kind of vendors. We also have relationships. You know, we have all those those hospitals that kind of spread out. 
but uh, Atrium does not own outright own all those hospitals. Some of those we have relationships with, where we own part of their management or something. So there could be employees there that maybe they have a separate IS department from us. So for those folks, they're truly considered external from Microsoft's definition, which is they don't have one of our licenses for Office 365. So for them to work on documents with us, uh, they need to come in with this external sharing. And like I said here, it's really external sharing is defined by users that just don't have a license in their town. Um, the options are pretty limited about how you can configure this. You can outright disable it. Uh, you can enable it, but they have to log in with some kind of user account. Uh, and you can whitelist or blacklist domains. So if you don't want to allow Hotmail and Gmail accounts, you can block those. Um, I think that was added right around 2015. But you can also enable anonymous guest links, which our security department was freaked out about that. They did not like that idea. An anonymous guest link is simply, you can send somebody a link, they click on it, the file opens without ever knowing who they are or whatever, it's truly anonymous, right? They can forward it to a thousand of their friends and all those people could open that file. So that's why we have to decide. Uh, these options can be set on each SharePoint site collection or all OneDrive sites. I kind of have a feeling, I think I read something about OneDrive is getting a little more specific, but um, the, way it's, the way that I know it's configured is it, it applies to all OneDrive sites. You can't say this particular OneDrive can have external sharing, but this one cannot. It's all or not. So here is the issue that we ran into. <clears throat> when a site owner sends an invitation to an email address, say John Doe at partner.com, John Doe receives the email and clicks on the link. And if they don't have what, what Microsoft calls an organization account, or sometimes the phrase is work or school account, uh, then you can either use or create a Microsoft account. Which, you know, if any of us have Hotmail accounts, well, we also have Microsoft accounts, right? Those accounts can be used to accept any of these invitations. Uh, so we would see things in our, in our logs that were, you know, jdoe at roadrunner.com. Um, has access to document that the site owner had sent to John Doe at partner.com because he clicked the link, created the account, and then used that account to access the file. Um, Microsoft solved this. In fact, for a while they called it, uh, from what I heard, a golden ticket. I mean, just had that ticket. Luckily, they fixed that. Uh, so you can now explicitly say that you have to accept that invitation with a user account that has the same email address as it was sent to. But you know this, the one other issue that you have though with this still, uh, with external sharing is that, let's say I work for, uh, you know, I'm John Doe at the partner.com company. And I set up a Microsoft account because my company doesn't have Office 365, so it's a Microsoft account. I have access to the Patreon files. When I leave that partner.com company, the Microsoft account doesn't go away. It's still something that I can use because it's associated to me, not my company, even though it kind of looks like my so it's a, something that you have to really think through about how you're going to manage those accounts. We do things like create reports and things to try to highlight to a side of this, and then it's their responsibility to keep track of everyone that they get access to. And we, we have a schedule that they're supposed to go out and check the commission and look at these accounts and verify that yes, that person still works for that company and should still have access. Um, you know, when you're all internal, this is a step that you really don't have to worry about because the accounts just go away because somebody stops getting paid, right? So there's a whole process in place to make sure that those accounts get shut down. Uh, so here's some of the things that we did to reduce our risk uh, with external sharing. We turned on uh, DLP, so data loss prevention. Uh, that's in OneDrive and SharePoint. Uh, we set those rules up. We have one set of rules for HIPAA data and one set of rules for PCI. We allow HIPAA, uh, we do not allow PCI in SharePoint um, uh, once we Once we enabled that, then our security and compliance thought that we'd reduce the risk enough that sensitive data would be overshared, so they allowed us to turn on the uh, both the OneDrive sync and the external sharing of OneDrive. Is DLP a flag requirement? No. So what is DLP? DLP, what is it? And it might be the same thing that's applied to Exchange. We have a different uh, flavor of DLP for Exchange. I think we use, uh, is it Bumtu or McAfee? I thought I used 
So, yeah, yeah, these things can be kind of tricky. The DLP from Microsoft for SharePoint Wonder, what it does is it um, uses AI machine learning something to figure out, uh, you know, uh, whatever the pattern is to say that this is a HIPAA document or that you know, it's got some kind of sensitive data that way. And there's all these different rules that you can turn on and they can then do things about that. So, in our case, if you are sharing HIPAA data to somebody outside the company that has watched you from doing that directly, you have to go in and give a business justification, or you have to say that this is not HIPAA data. So it's automated classification yeah. of the company. Yeah. The other important thing is that it happens on sharing, not just uploading it. So if you up, if you upload it into a, a folder or something that is shared, then it will kick in, from, kind of from what I understand. But if you, you can upload these things, you can store them there, it's when the active when you go to share it, it's really when it kicks in. And it's all based on a, a search engine too. So there's a, there's a little bit of time there when you upload it until the search goes through and indexes it, but it doesn't know it's necessarily a sensitive document yet. It's relatively new. Um, we turned it on last year, the end of last year, but I think it had been out for at least maybe a year before that. Is it doing it beyond, like, when I've seen it being used before, it was like if it follows the pattern of a social security card or an uh, insurance card number. So certainly is, is doing it beyond anything besides like more so joint numbers? Yeah, it's got, uh, you know, Microsoft has all these, I don't want to call them red egg scores, but I get the feeling that that's where they started, right? Um, and, but it rolls a whole set of those up to say an industry standard like HIPAA. So inside of that, HIPAA is going to be things like a, a DEA, DEA number that a physician would have in order to prescribe drugs. Or, you know, there could be other things. Uh, and they have like US and UK, but essentially it makes it, it's very simple. You go and you pick your industry that you need to protect. PCI is going to capture all the credit card numbers. In fact, we had a lot of false positives for a while because uh, we have Epic, which is a, right. our, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have Epic for our billing system. Um, those, some serial number in Epic looks a lot like a Discovery or a Discover credit card for some reason. I don't know. And, and it's not just like, a, there's a lot of math that goes into those credit card numbers to tell you it's, it's a real problem. They were, the Epic team was a little upset with people involved in that. But it does, it blocks and it sends emails. Uh, we get reports whenever those happen. And, you know, we have a page to try to describe our end users like, you know, this is not necessarily an Instagram. This could be legitimate, just go out there and say whatever your business reason is for sharing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So we do have like one, one thing that we did for uh, our SharePoint site collections. So, and this is kind of key for a lot of these decisions that we made around our governance. Um, a lot of the decisions are at the SharePoint site collection level. So things like external sharing, uh, SharePoint designer, um, there's a couple other that are right now, but those settings mean that we define someone at Atrium as a, as a site owner that owns a site collection because that's the person responsible for making those decisions for, for that site. Right? So uh, things like external sharing, we ask the site owner, do you want to accept that risk or do you need that functionality? or you just want to leave it off. So it's really up to them on a case-by-case with the site collections. And then we do our best to provide more information so that they understand what's going on because SharePoint can be rather complex to figure out all the permissions. So we try to pull down some basic reports that we create on a weekly basis that are like spreadsheets that they can look at who has access to their site, all the external sharing users uh, that are in there, that sort of thing. Next question. Yes. Do you police like the compliance issues? Do you, do you have like a somebody that's tagged as the person before you actually publish it to the package as well? Or are you still giving freedom to the users to, to go ahead and like upload an Excel spread? Well, actually, I guess obviously you're blocking some different things. But do you do any policing of what they're actually adding to SharePoint? Are you sure that's not like duplicate information being uh -oh. published? Or, no. Okay. Um, that's a good question. So that, and that really gets to be kind of a, a problem that we're, we're trying to think through how we might tackle that. Uh, how uh, just the, the management of the content. 
And you know, I said at the beginning we had something like 7,000, I think it's actually for 8,000 now, which is SharePoint sites, if you include all the subsites. Um, and we can have those just have duplicate names. Uh, and it's, you know, when you're spread out so much as we are, we don't have just one HR department, right? We've got one for each facility, so if you think about that, so there's 40 hospitals, so there's like maybe an HR person at that hospital that's on that team or something. So, yeah, I guess it's kind of a tricky thing to try and dictate from, from headquarters as to what the names of everything are and where they store things. But yeah. That's a good question. We really don't. Do you see a difference between the OneDrive and the SharePoint? So like with our corporate aspect, um, we, we'd have a problem if somebody created a uh, basically a OneDrive and, and used the same uh, you know, address, email address, in corporate, it is a personal, then we need to have a problem um, getting the difference between the two. So basically, our, you know, if it's a corporate side, it's a SharePoint. It does everything on the SharePoint. It doesn't do much with OneDrive. It has to everything the SharePoint drive. So, yeah, the, the issue that you run into there is if people have created a Microsoft account with the same email address as what they're logging in, yeah. Um, you can do that. and it, it, can work in some bizarre scenarios, but it gets to be very tricky. Like for ours, if you're on one of our computers, it's going to try to log you in as one of our corporate accounts. Um, plus, good luck trying to explain that to the end users. That this is a Microsoft account, and, has, and the usernames are the same. And, yeah. um, so we, we honestly don't see too much of that. I tell you, for a while we were seeing it with our dev team because MSDN did not allow you to, to link up to uh, your corporate accounts. So they go out there and create these things using their work email address because they thought, you know, this is a work thing. So untangling that has been kind of, luckily it was the dev, so they kind of figure it out. Um, but yeah, it could be tricky on that. You know, the other kind of mistake we made early on was that a lot of our corporate communications team thought SharePoint was kind of around a while, it was kind of boring or something, and so they wanted to emphasize OneDrive as the, the new thing, right? Um, and so we saw a pattern, and still see it, where people would use OneDrive for things where it really should be documents owned by a team on a SharePoint site. Because it seems to be like we, we have an ever-increasing number of calls of someone in a panic because the document that they were using is suddenly gone, and then we get out of them. Well, that person left a month ago, and it was on their OneDrive site. So of course it was automatically deleted. And then we, we kind of dig into that, and I'm like, and it, this can even be the manager who got the email saying that the OneDrive's going to be deleted. And I'm like, well, what did you think that that email said? <laughs> it was automated, so I deleted it. Well, no, in their defense, in their defense, what they tell us uh, is this. They go into their OneDrive site, and they look on the left, and it says files, and then it says shared with me. They click on shared with me, and they see all those files, and they, in their mind, it's their OneDrive, their files. I'm like, no, those are links to the files everywhere so so they get they have they get all confused about where things are actually stored and what, what the ramifications are for those conditions so we've tried to emphasize especially whenever we find out about these mission critical files that are stuck in somebody's OneDrive like no 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 that should be in a SharePoint site well it was kind of a weird balance because OneDrive was basically unlimited storage uh, and SharePoint up until this year we were much more limited I think we were starting to use up to 35 percent of our allocation maybe um, whereas OneDrive, you know, so it was, I don't know, if I fight that argument, you never didn't move from OneDrive into SharePoint, that's going to be out of room over there. So, luckily, Microsoft increased the number, we don't have to worry about it. So, in that scenario, what happens to those files? Is there a way to get them There is, there is. So, it used to be that you would have to open up a support table with Microsoft and do so within seven days of being deleted, or else it was gone. Um, now they have. It's like a 93-day window, and I, I can't quite remember when the clock starts ticking on that. But they must have gotten so many calls that they finally gave us a PowerShell command, or you went to, I think, through the, the website, the admin site. You can restore those one drives. Um, you can also set so that the 30 days are, um, is a longer period of time. Um, you know, for us, it, it doesn't, my feeling on that is that no matter what we set it to, we would still get the, the surprise phone calls, whether it's 30 days or 90 days or two years. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was going to be deleted. Um, it's just that people won't if you don't set the deadline. And then all of a sudden you've got these files hanging around that uh, I don't think our legal department wants us hanging on to for it, among others. So, yeah. But yeah, you can take with that a little bit. You can also be transfer ownership to 
It does. It does automatically, yeah. So the supervisor, as long as the manager field in Active Directory is filled in, that person gets not only access, but the email saying this OneDrive is going to be deleted. And it's, it's a very simple thing to move those files to their OneDrive or to another SharePoint. Now you can just select all and, select and choose move. Uh, and, and it keeps all the information on the files intact too, like version history and the dates and the, you know, all of that stuff. Where if you download and upload it, all of a sudden it's today's date. Uh, but the code keeps all that intact. So. Why don't we take a break here? Gap in our timeline of 2014 was basically, as I like to put it, aligning the environment to match Microsoft. Uh, clients and desktops, we, we updated to, we had Windows 7 across the board, we got IE 10 up there, and then we've since upgraded to, to IE 11. We've got Office 2013, we started understanding we had to stay on the train of, of constant upgrades. So we're, Office 2016. Um, some other things that we we're just looking for are pilots. Uh, you know, exchange known boxes. Really, that's pretty much a no brainer uh, when it came to the impact of users. Uh, the, the one funny thing was, and Microsoft was absolutely accurate in this. They told us that about 10% of your folks, no matter what you do, they will call in because they can't get their email after you move it. Uh, and that's simply because the login is their email address, not their SAM account or the old username that everybody's used. No matter how many emails you send to them, they're going to ignore it. They're just going to call it. So 10% was pretty accurate. Um, we all our new SharePoint sites were in SharePoint Online. Um, OneDrive was a net new, so it was it was pretty easy. Yammer, the interesting is anybody a Yammer user fan? Fan? User or fan? All right, how about users? User. User. How about fan? Fan. Fan. No. Oh, we got one. Very good. <laughs> I'm a big Yammer fan. Uh, I'll have to come back. It's another place. Just play All right. Uh, Yammer actually spread virally. It's kind of designed to do that. Uh, our CIO got all excited prior to our launch. And went out there and signed up for Yammer, and he was, he was a good trooper, and he was going to you know, try this stuff out. And, and email his, his uh, address book, I think. Hey, come to it. Well, of course, when he joined, everybody had to. So, so it spread very quickly. So when we go, went to launch Office 365, finally we were back on track January 2015. We had solved our compliance issues, the environment was upgraded, uh, we were ready to go. Uh, we started with OneDrive. It was net new, so it was kind of the least uh, disruptive thing we could do. Right? Uh, it allowed us to kind of ease into this new idea of, of logging in. You have to click on the link on our website to get there. Uh, but if you do see a login prompt, you type in your email address, not just your short username. And, you know, that went pretty well. We didn't do any kind of concerted uh, IT file moves. It was really up to end users to move their stuff. Uh, and we did that, you know, and it was kind of a, a couple of reasons to do that. Uh, one, uh, for people, it, it gives them a chance to practice using the new stuff. Uh, and it also gives them the opportunity to delete anything they really don't need. Uh, so it gives them an opportunity to clean everything up. Um, Plus, you know, for us, it would be very disruptive as an IT department to come in and move their their home directory to their OneDrive because maybe they haven't been using OneDrive yet, so now they can get to their files because they've never used it before. Um, and we moved a bunch of junk that they really don't need, so we just left it up to them. Uh, by February, so we did these in one month increments. So the next month in February, uh, we stopped anybody from asking for SharePoint 2010, which really nobody was, so that was kind of easy. Everything was SharePoint online. That's when we started the migrations of the SharePoint sites from 2010 to online. We also started the exchange migrations in earnest. Uh, like I said, they would do a batch of those each week. And then uh, you know, we get the, the email so we could, couldn't do everybody all at once because that'd be too many phone calls. So um, they did it over several months. And then by March, we officially pulled out Yammer. And you know, for Yammer, it was actually driven more from the HR department. They wanted a uh, teammate engagement social media platform, I think I said that correctly. So, uh, one of the things for Yammer, my SharePoint team, we actually use it quite a bit to answer any of your questions about SharePoint, so it's very good for that. Uh, if anybody's curious, this was kind of our schedule for migrating our SharePoint sites. Um, we did these overlapping, but it was, uh, you know, Monday through Friday, 
So on Monday, we would have this site over. On Tuesday, we would test it. On Wednesday, we would continue testing it. And then on Thursday, you can see how the SharePoint team is in black and the business team is in red there. So on Thursday, then, the team would switch over to actually moving to production, the, the week two stuff. And then on Friday, we were looking at the next batch to migrate. So we spaced things out. We, we might have been able to do things a little bit quicker, but we just didn't have the resources to, to prepare our efforts fully each week. So it's the same people that just spread out. <clears throat> you know, we, and we did work with some consulting companies that thought we could go much, much quicker. Um, but we knew our environment. There was no way we were going to digest moving all that stuff so rapidly. Um, so you know, we did spread it out so that it wasn't this huge disruption that it might have been. Uh, the site collections, so we moved them, um, let's see, I think I tried to show the graph on this, so it's kind of anticlimactic now. We did the bulk of them from May to September uh, 287. But at the end of that, uh, there's no more SharePoint on premise. We decommissioned the farm and shut the bulk down. Uh, for exchange, they finished those up. The last set of them is kind of an interesting story because the, the previous mailboxes were relatively painless to move. They got, they got down to um, a bunch of, like it started with executives and their assistants, and it was this huge spider web of relationships between their calendars. Because you'd have one assistant supporting two executives, and then, you know, maybe some other people that report up to the executive would have. All of a sudden, it, you know, kind of like we printed out a diagram, and it would go like the two or three of these tables of just a spider web of all these connections. So really, the only way to do it would be to move them all at once, or else you were going to break the permissions between each one of those. So that's what they did. Finally, we just had to wait because we were talking to our CEO and our C-suite. We were a little nervous. I think everybody was. So they kind of waited until like it had been fully, fully made to an organization. There was, there was truly no problem. So they, um, the last one was Skype for Business. So we had the Skype for Business servers on prem, and uh, you know that was it was struggling with this one. Uh, but then we decided to move it to Skype for Business or Skype Online. And actually, we did that pretty quick. It was uh, just over two quarters, uh, got everybody moved. So we got, uh, I think we shut down all of our PGI, you know, the phone call conference call system that you could have. All that shut down, so it's all Skype, Skype for business. That's been pretty well. One of the things that we had, and, and I put it in this category, because this was another way of aligning things, was our SharePoint team. The skill set over time changed a little bit. Um, you can see over the years, we've always had at least one person dedicated to support, so that uh, that person on my team. So we have a, a support center that everybody calls into, the call center. Uh, that team has 12 minutes to answer the question, or they kick it over to an application team to answer it. So we do our best to give them the information so that they can diagnose and answer questions quickly. Uh, otherwise, it falls to the one person there. And we get about, uh, I think, 20 support calls a week that are like that that are very fast. Um, we've had a SharePoint instructor over the years. When we were doing a lot of migrations, we were trying to train up our SharePoint side owners just to get used to the new, uh, new UI. We were going from 2010 to basically 2013 SharePoint, so there's some differences there. Uh, and people would say they knew 2010, but they kind of didn't, so we were teaching all kinds of SharePoint. Uh, but anyways, that transitioned to a contractor role then, uh, and that's worked out pretty well. Uh, we've had the SharePoint admin, and this one has changed. It hasn't necessarily disappeared. Uh, this was one I thought would completely disappear, but it, it kind of changed. Instead of somebody who was focused on keeping the servers up and running, uh, you know, doing patches and all that, uh, you know, we used to have a what well, we do. We have a patch Saturday once a month where, uh, you know, when we had SharePoint on prem, we had to come in and make sure the remote end to make sure everything was still running after all patches were deployed. Uh, that's really one of the great things about SharePoint Online is that I don't have patch Saturdays anymore, so no more 5 a.m. weekends. But <clears throat> the SharePoint admin is still still there because there's still things to monitor from like an admin space. Uh, things like uh, being in the admin center, checking the message center daily for, for messages from Microsoft about changes coming or what you need to do. Or uh, in this case, they also act as our next level of uh, end user support. So if the, the support person can't answer it, then it goes up to the SharePoint admin. 
We've also had SharePoint analysts over the years. That's kind of like a business analyst that knows how to do how to buy SharePoint stuff. Um, we briefly had SharePoint designer skills, which was kind of like a, a branding type type skill set. Uh, SharePoint dev is coming on a little bit. Um, the SharePoint architect manager, really, I filled that role most of the time. Um, yeah, and the PM tech lead. So actually, we filled that position this year. Uh, it says hiring, but we have a SharePoint team supervisor in the house. All right, so change management. <clears throat> How do you keep up with the speed of the internet? It's Microsoft uh, And their goal is really to keep Office 365 constantly changing. And it, it was something that we heard early on that they were going to move at the speed of the internet. Um, and we really didn't believe them or something, I don't know. Uh, but they aren't kidding, things do change. They will not hold up everything just to wait for you to get past your IE8 problems. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is a slide I grabbed off of the Microsoft website. And I've got a link down here and I'll just show this with the slides. But it just goes through their different uh, rings that they have. And you probably, if you're familiar with just the Windows releases, uh, you'll, you'll know these different rings of how they, uh, Microsoft will test it internally first a couple of times, a couple of different rings, before it goes to the blue colors there, which is things that you can get your hands on. So uh, in this slide it says targeted release and then standard release is the outermost. So keeping that in mind, we set up two different tenants. Uh, one, and they're, they're, and Microsoft actually are both production. We pay for both of them. Uh, the test tenant, though, we only license, you know, maybe 100 IT folks to use this thing. But it is configured with that targeted release, meaning that it gets the updates before what we consider our production tenant gets their updates. So that's the way that we can test and try to stay ahead of the curve. But it is a full-blown environment with a, a dev AD domain. We've got EFS servers there. Uh, we've got a couple of joint workstations to the domain, so we can truly mimic everything. Uh, and our Office 365 team, our team internally uses it to test. It's really good because there, there are just some settings that when you go into Office 365, there is no, there's no way to isolate it to just a particular SharePoint site or just a mailbox or something that is a tenant-wide setting. So, you know, unless you're testing in production, it's good to have this other tenant. You know, the other option there might be to set up a, just a trial tenant. Those come and go pretty quick. You know, I have them for 30 days or something. Maybe you can get it extended a couple of times, but to set up all of this with machines joined to the domain and AD and ADFS and all that stuff, that's a lot of work to tear down and set up each one. So we just went ahead and have a program one. Uh, there is a very, potentially very small gap from test to prod, or from Microsoft's targeted release to production. So you have to try and stay up on top of that if it's something that you're concerned about. Because they, at one point in their documentation, they said it could take as little as seven days for a feature to go from, from targeted release to production, or standard release. Uh, this was something that was kind of strange that we ran into early on. Updates may apply to a user, not necessarily a tenant. Uh, one of the things that they did early on for us was to update the OneDrive UI. And it was really this new toolbar. I even since then, I think it's been updated. But uh, we noticed in about April 2014, some of our folks started seeing a new thing across the top. Um, but not all of us were seeing it. Well, it turns out this was something that was rolling out for a user. Um, so, you know, this we were kind of new at this thing at the time, so we ended up support taking and confirming it. Sure enough, it was something that was rolling out for a user, and there was no way for us to say, please give it to the IT folks first so we can see it before any user. It was just kind of random. Now, there is a thing that they do have called the. Um, it's something like selective first release for a particular user account. So since then, they do give you the option. If it is something that can be rolled out for a user, you can designate certain user accounts to get it first. Um, this is kind of a, an interesting topic, disruptive changes. So Microsoft is, is on the record that if they have a disruptive change, I mean, they're going to announce it and give everybody enough notice for it. Uh, the one issue might be, though, that they define what a disruptive change is. So it depends on, on your point of view on that. Um, so here's an example of, from this last two years. Uh, anybody using the Access Web Apps when they were in SharePoint? No. Now, this was something that came out in, I think, January of 2014 or so. Um, but Microsoft came out and announced 
uh, in March or April that it was deprecated or going away. Um, in fact, and this, this is to their credit, we actually got a phone call. This has only happened once in five years, but it does happen. Um, but we got a phone call from one of the product group uh, saying, hey, by the way, we see that you are a heavy user of this Access Web Apps thing, and by the way, it's going away. So it was great to get the phone call from one of them. <laughs> It was kind of bad because we were such a heavy user that we were on that radar. Uh, but we did get a 12 plus month notice, and they did work with us quite a bit. So we had, even the 12 months was extended. Uh, you know, just working with them to prove that we were actively trying to get off of these things. So that was, their flexibility was very good on that. And you know, when we, we went through into the inventory of it, turns out that most of them were just people going out there and trying it out, as, and a lot of them were just called tests. We took an inventory and, and worked our way through it. Like three quarters of them are just something that could be deleted right away anyway. So is what's the do you have a single migration path out for that? No. So. No, they, the thing that Microsoft came up with was uh, that if you hadn't moved it by the end, what they would do is take whatever data you had in that it's really a SQL database behind the scenes. And they would just dump it into some SharePoint lists that were in that site, maybe. Yeah. Um, that was it. Right. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be like designing a solution. They were suggesting Power Apps as a front end for it, and maybe Power the other. Yeah, and you can take that database and you can move it to a SQL server that you're either in Azure or on prem or do something else with it that way. Yeah. Um, and they did give us some switches that was kind of nice. Uh, they didn't come out with it right away, but you could turn off creating new ones and then you could disable it. So it took a little bit. Uh, for those of you familiar with SharePoint, though, in, how many people are familiar with the InfoPath and Designer, SharePoint Designer? Yeah. How many people are still using that stuff? I would have to raise my hand, too. Uh, this is the one that kind of concerns me, because we're trying to figure out a way to get away from InfoPath and SharePoint Designer. We just took an inventory. We only have, I think, a few hundred SharePoint Designer workflows, which is much smaller than I thought we would have, so we're in good shape that way. Uh, but this is the actual language from the tech community. Uh, one of the SharePoint product group folks um, mentioned that, you know, trying to get some, some definition around this disruptive change. Uh, one of the things that they, they have run into is that if they have a security issue, which I think happened to the sandbox solution thing from a few years ago. I think that remembers that. They kind of turned it off abruptly. It was a way to deploy custom code in the SharePoint Online. Um, kind of looking back, that must have been what happened. They found some kind of security thing, uh, and so they had to turn it off rather quickly. So if they do run into that, just you know, understand that that's, that's something that can happen. Um, so I, I, I worry the day they find a SharePoint designer or InfoPath security bug and have to turn it off rather quickly. So, how do you keep up with all these changes? <clears throat> uh, the first place you go is in the admin center. You go to the service health dashboard. And there's a couple of things in there. You go to the service health, and that tells you like anything break fix that's going on. Um, and those issues that you see in there, it's defined as at least, Microsoft thinks that at least one of your users is impacted by whatever the outage is, so the why that. Um, oftentimes, though, there must be some kind of internal process to verify that stuff, because we have called in the, it's only after our call that we see the thing in the, the message center. So if something's broken, it may not be in the message center yet, or the service all the dashboard yet. The message center is their place for announcing new stuff that's coming or changes in, in configuration or things like that. The access app's going away, they will communicate to you that way. There's also an app for your phone uh, that I would highly suggest you have if you're in an administrative environment. Uh, you can get notifications follow up notices that way too. All right, some other ways to keep up. <clears throat> uh, the Office Blogs is a great uh, location. They moved it. It's now off the Microsoft Tech Community. Um, has, it, has everybody gone out to the Tech Community website? Familiar with that? It's, it's kind of like a huge discussion board area. But it's got a mix of blog posts. It's a great way, though, to tap into the product group making announcements directly, so you can read directly what they're saying. But there's a blogs thing at the top of the page now that is the Office team blogs. So all the different teams, SharePoint, OneDrive, they have blogs out there. Um, one of the things I suggest is just curate a list of blogs by industry MVPs. 
Uh, if you go to any events or these user groups, you know, speakers coming through, grab their blogs, uh, the addresses for those, and just keep track of them. I use, uh, it used to be Google Reader, and now it's uh, uh, Feedly. I use the Feedly.com website. Just keep track of a bunch of blogs that way. Um, the, the one, it, you know, Microsoft will point to this roadmap. In my opinion, it's a little thin on details. And, you know, they, they don't want to be thinned down on dates, so they typically don't publish dates there. It's more, and maybe they can, but it's, it's more uh, vaguely worded like by this quarter or by the end of the year or something like that. Um, in fact, I've got a sample of one here. And we were getting all excited because people thought we were going to get some very detailed Yammer reports, among others. And those, uh, you know, if you read it, it's kind of funny because we've, we've grown accustomed to this where we get all excited, we read that description, and then we imagine what it is, which is never what it is. The reality is that the reports came out were good, but it wasn't what we were expecting or hoping for. Um, that's a good infographic, too, that summarizes a lot of this stuff, how to keep up. Um, this kind of points out that you really have to keep track in different locations. So that access web apps, you know, we got the phone call. We were lucky enough to get that. Um, but if you go through all of these things, so I pointed out seven different places, the actual public announcement was number six, which was a brand new blog that didn't exist until that very first post that the Access Web Apps were going away. Um, it's kind of, kind of funny in that regard, kind of difficult to develop. So how do we handle changes at Atrium? We have individual teams, SharePoint Exchange, Desktop, uh, all of the different teams monitor news as much as we can from Microsoft using the blogs and message center. Uh, we, we meet weekly as an Office 365 team, our leads, uh, and that's just to cross-coordinate what's going on. So uh, try to coordinate because almost everything we deal with affects one another. You know, if they're checking up, change something with the way the browsers are configured, then that's going to directly impact SharePoint or the way Office is deployed. All those things are tied together. Now, we also have a, a governance group, a teammate work group, where we get sign-off for things that are going to impact our teammates. So we go to them and kind of get their blessing, different changes going through. Uh, how do we communicate the change? Uh, you know, we, we heard loud and strong from our folks uh, that they really don't like getting emails. I think a lot of us are like that. Uh, so instead, we, we use Yammer, and we explain it this way. If you're interested in these updates, go tune into Yammer. And we're not going to beat you over the head with a bunch of emails or, or other notifications. Um, so generally, we'll put stuff on Yammer. Uh, and it is kind of a niche thing, if you are interested or not. Uh, people connect our top level internet. If it is something a little more disruptive for our folks, we'll post it there. Uh, and then it keeps going. We'll, we'll try to do focused emails if we need to go that route. Uh, last resort is really enterprise wide emails. And we only did that when we launched the three different things. Um, haven't done much, I don't really think, any sense. Uh, and then, you know, the announcement on the home page of people connect, which is set as everybody's home page in our browsers. So we get a lot of that. About some of this. I thought I wouldn't have enough content. Let's go to this. So this is what our environment looks like today. Well, I should say, this is before we got Office 365. So you can see we're like, oh, that top line is 0.9 terabytes. So just over 800 gigs. This is what it was as of today. We have 10 terabytes in SharePoint. So we're actually between SharePoint and OneDrive, we are doubling every 12 months the amount of stuff we're storing out there. Uh, and that goes back to 2010, as far back as my numbers are. Yes? So where are the user sub directories? Are they SharePoint, are they OneDrive, or are they on-prem? Like, on They're still on-prem. So this is all stuff that people have either moved or created out there fresh. So, yeah. Now can you now map a drive to your OneDrive? No, the closest that you get is with the OneDrive Sync client. Right. Um, and there are some things that you could do to, to point some of those default locations to the sync area, uh, but we have we have just haven't done that path. One of the, the quirks that we have in our environment is Citrix. Uh, so until we get, yeah, I see some, some fellow Citrix environment. Okay. Um, one of the things that I'm really hoping for is uh, files on demand to help with Citrix. Because if you have files on demand, meaning it's 
it's just got that like shortcut. Yeah. Then when, when the so. strict environment resets overnight, um, the next day it's not a big deal. You still see the folders, although they're not downloaded until you click on them. So, uh, our Citrix, they just upgraded it to not Windows 10. It was it's like uh, it, it gets the Windows 10 desktop experience on Windows Server, which I guess is the way to do that. So I don't know like, where my calls on the man. Yeah, so here's some more raw numbers. Like I said, it's doubling in size every 12 months. And this is going back. Like, this is not a new pattern. Um, I figured at some point it would. It's like Moore's Law or something at this point. Uh, we have about almost 1,000 site collections. Um, those seven or 8,000 subsites. Um, one stat that might jump out there is the Office 365 groups. So I've got a slide on that. But we have over 1,100 of those things now. Uh, 4 million plus files in SharePoint. Uh, in September, we had 26,000 active users. For OneDrive, we had 15 terabytes, uh, 7 million active files, and 11,000 active users in the last 30 days. Uh, and the whole storage increase this summer uh, really made the SharePoint storage one that I don't worry about. I think at the current rate, we're not going to run out for another eight years. So if that keeps up. So here are some of the issues that we're working through. This is a has anybody seen this before, the periodic table, Office 365? That's kind of a neat thing. There used to be a SharePoint wheel that everybody used about eight years ago to explain SharePoint. Well, this is kind of a new way of doing it. Uh, but it's for Office 365. So it tries to map out all the different things that are out there. So what I've highlighted here is what was available to us and what we turned on uh, right when we signed the contract. Right? So you can see you've got Word, Excel, OneNote, PowerPoint, Online, you've got SharePoint, OneDrive. This whole row is just exchange, you know, email, calendar, people text. So this is what it is since then. So this is all the new stuff that has been coming out. Um, and that is, I think it's kind of eye-opening just to see over the last, and this is five years, so, um, it, you know, five, four years. But we have turned on or enabled almost all of these things. There's a few here and there that we didn't. But, um, you know, looking at it this way, we had wanted to come up with a new way to, to govern it, because it used to be that we would tightly control the rollout of these things. Um, but instead of doing that, we're now shifting to more of this, where we look at these new workloads when Microsoft announces them or releases them, gets ready to. Microsoft's doing a better job without probably us ahead of time. Uh, but we look at them for any kind of compliance or security issues. So a good example is Sway. Uh, Sway is not technically HIPAA compliant, so we don't want to turn that on for our environment. Um, so we, we actively go out there and turn it off because we looked into it, it's not HIPAA compliant. But if we don't run into a red flag like that, we're just going to let it roll. Whenever Microsoft lights it up, our users are going to get it. And we've tried to try to explain to our users and our leadership, like this is just the, the way it is. You know, you don't, you, Facebook rolls out an update, uh, Twitter rolls out an update, anybody. It just happened. Uh, this is the world we're in now. Um, we, but we don't have enough IT people to answer every question about everything. So we try to come up with it logically this way. We have four workloads in 365. These are fully supported by IIS. IAS is the name of our department. But that's Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, Yammer, Skype, all the traditional ones. We will fully fix anything that we can break fits, tickets, or support. We'll work on training, uh, documenting tutorials, answering questions as much as we can on how to use it, uh, right? But when it comes to the selective workloads, it's the stuff that will turn on, but it's really up to you to figure out how you might want to use it. So it's kind of a compromise, where we won't turn it off anymore, but we're not going to necessarily have classes on how to use uh, Sway or something. Right? I'm sorry? Yeah, in a large way. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we talked to another healthcare organization, they called it uh, community supported, which is kind of a cute way to put it, I like too. But it really is. Uh, it's partially supported in that we'll make sure, we'll do what we can to make sure the lights are on and that things are working as they should. But we're not going to sit down and figure out how to build a power app with you. If you want to learn how to do that, well, power to you. Um, but there's not going to necessarily be formal training. You can post questions on Yammer. Maybe somebody, if they know, will answer it. It's a little bit different. 
Uh, the Office 365 groups, I want to touch on this one too because I think this is a hot topic. Uh, 365 groups, and we really were not sure how to handle these for a long time. And I don't know, we, we still don't know how, but you know, we kept it turned off until we came across this. Notice that there it says Microsoft Stream. That's that video, uh, like YouTube-like service. It's an Office 365. It's really nice. You upload videos and it'll do automatic closed captioning of the videos that you upload. It makes it very searchable. You can take them and embed them in SharePoint pages. It's a very nice service. But in order to create a channel, the channel is actually an Office 365 group. So more and more services are tied in and they just assume that Office 365 groups are a thing that people can use. So finally, we're like, okay, well, we're just going to have to turn it on. We come up with that new governance about um, at the same time. So just say, all right, we're going to let people create groups. Uh, and you can see right down the line, uh, Power BI, uh, which we adopted last year, uh, it's required for their workspaces, although I think they tweaked that. You don't have to do that. But, you know, if you're talking about Microsoft Teams, if you're going to move to that, which all of us are at some point if you're using Skype. Uh, it's required for, for Teams. So this is what it looks like when we turn it on. These, by the way, are years over here, and then it goes to months. So for a long time, we had very little usage. For a while there, we had it accidentally turned on, so people were creating some very interesting groups. Uh, but then once we learned how to turn it off, we did. Until Memorial Day of this year, when we turned it on for a stream. And then look at that. It, we are averaging 200 new groups a month uh, since then. So we're not quite sure what people are using all these groups for. Um, Is that a good thing? Yeah. I, are they are these mail groups, or is it, are they also a security group in terms of access to a SharePoint? Yes, they are all of this. So it, it creates a mailbox in exchange that can have like shared mailbox functionality, it's got a shared calendar, it can act like a distribution list. Uh, it creates a SharePoint site collection attached to it. Uh, if you start in Yammer, uh, it would create it from there. So it'll create a SharePoint site. I don't think it creates the exchange piece, but maybe. Uh, you know, in Stream, you have channels available. If you're using Planner, all of a sudden you've got plans available. All that stuff gets created. Picking any one of those, the other things gets spun up too. In our case, it looks like most everybody's using Outlook to create these, and they're adding very few people to it. Like we, we built some custom utilities just to document how many, how many people are owners of the groups and how many people are in the groups, and we have hundreds that are like one person owner and no members. So I'm not sure. Just created it. And I don't know if they thought it would act like a, uh, like just an Outlook contact list or something, something very small. So are those just for internal users or external or both? Both. So an yeah. external user can actually be part of the same group. Yes, they can. It's a little bit different when you put them in a group, though. They, they don't have access to the exchange piece of it. They would have access to the SharePoint piece. The exchange piece, they can interact with it by sending an email to it and receiving emails from it, but they can't get to like the exchange mailbox. No. Groups is very new, obviously, for us. So your mileage may vary there. But, um, Teams is, you know, this is really the, the most recent thing that we've been dealing with uh, as we want to get to a point where we turn on Teams. Um, one of the things that I struggle with, well, there's a couple of things. It, it crosses departments within our IS department. So who owns what is a whole new conversation. Um, but the one thing that I've been struggling with <clears throat> is trying to come up with a 30 second elevator pitch to explain to a nurse or a physician or, or somebody in accounting as to why they should care about Teams. And, and as I've, I've, kind of, I've talked a lot with our local Microsoft team about this, like I cannot have an interlude power move. Has, anyone, has, has everyone heard that phrase, interlude power move? Yeah, 45 all the time. Okay. <laughs> well, this was a big thing in Ignite, I think last year, where Microsoft came out and explained that Teams, uh, Teams is like your interlude of people that you work with on a regular basis. And the outer loop is Yammer, where it's like the whole organization, potentially a much wider, much bigger audience. Um, now, all of you can kind of understand that, right? Because we're all kind of familiar with these things. I can't have that conversation with a physician or a nurse. They're going to be like, whatever are you talking about? Um, 
So yeah, it, it kind of does conversations better than Yammer and Outlook, and it kind of does chat and conferencing better than Skype, but not a so lot better. Increasingly, it's a bar. Yeah, right? It's it's not that much different. Now, our organization. Every day, I love it. Yeah? Yeah, and you could, maybe you just need to tell the doctors and nurses, for this floor, have your little team for this floor, you know, or yeah. for this department. Like all of our radiology departments could talk together on this team. And uh, we have ours broken down into smaller groups. And it works really well for us. But we're looking at it. It's, uh, in fact, we've got a Microsoft coming in for a, uh, they've got some templates set up for healthcare in particular. One of them is for, to do a virtual huddle through Teams. So I'm curious to see that. So I, yes, absolutely, we may come around. I'm just really struggling with how to package that up as something to, to sell very quickly. Small so you're working with a different class of physicians than I'm working with, because most of them get to work right before they, or the patient's already been in the room 10 minutes, yeah, uh, they don't have time, nor want to take the time to learn any new IT stuff. That's why you're there. Your situation. Uh, and it feels like OneDrive is kind of an easier thing because it took one person to use their OneDrive, right? This team stuff doesn't work until you get the whole team using it. Because if it's just one or two people, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna struggle there. Yeah. I'll be curious to see how we do in the next couple of years. And at, at some point, we'll have to turn on because of Skype. So our hand will be forced. Okay, I'm going to skip this. I think I'm going to wind this down. I've got some more info if people are interested. Feel free to reach out. But uh, yes, I, I did have a couple. Uh, so my question for you is: In the beginning, you came up, I'm sure, with the budget cost, and I'm not really worried about the numbers. Uh, but you probably came up with the budget cost in a time frame to roll it out. Uh, so there was an initial uh, set aside for that. How did that apply to the end result? I mean, were you 50% off of your time, like your time and your budget? No well, that's a good question. I think they were, I don't know that they took labor into account. I think they were looking at just the um, the on-prem exchange costs of running those servers and, the, um, you know, and all the backups and the storage space and all of that, like hardware stuff, comparing that to exchange online. I think that was what the cost justification was. Yeah, so I see your numbers and then how, like, for a year, y'all kind of postponed the this. Yeah. I didn't know how the planning aspect was with that and yeah. how they you know, offset some of that or whatever, especially when you're sitting in architectural design when you're designing it out and roll it out. Right? Say so this is some of the hiccups that, that, that you ran into when you roll it out. But it just be tricky too because if you like delay buying storage, like, yeah, we don't need to buy storage this year because we're going to exchange online or SharePoint online, but you get delayed like that. You get caught if you have to buy that storage and do something on the last minute. Yeah. Luckily, we didn't run into those issues. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. That some of those people passed on the labor. I'm sure some of you don't. Did you factor in keeping your on prem storage in place from the beginning, or do you eventually plan to move all of that required? So the on prem storage, what they looked at was not purchasing additional storage. So delaying the purchases was really uh, some savings there. And a lot of our uh, a lot of our SharePoint machines were virtual machines. So once we you know deleted those, you're talking about recovering all the C drives and the data drives, uh, not not just the 500 gigs or whatever the SQL was taking. Yeah. Plus the servers and the, the licensing around that stuff. So it was a, probably a significant savings there too, because we had 13 servers for production. Only a couple of which were hardware. You've kind of shown them how you manage the environment. Patriot is obviously a growing company, and lots of when acquisition mergers. And yeah, I'm kind of going through a little bit of that uh, when I come down with it now. And we've merged all these things, but like the one thing is still out there is SharePoint. We're still separate. So how do you how do you handle that? Yeah, does every team member have a responsibility as far as onboarding? like another company or do you have a dedicated folks that work on that? Well, most of the time. So like we have, sometimes this happens with an existing regional for us where they change from say managing so much on their own to having us manage it for them. Uh, so we have one in particular I know, uh, Scotland, uh, Scotland County, that helps us to out there. <laughs> okay. I mean, they point that way. Um, they, they're actually being converted and they're 
IS department are, are now our full-time employees, so they got converted over. And they are rolling through that environment and they're upgrading like the workstation. So they're doing like a team at a time. And when they upgrade the workstations, they're putting our image on there. And that's when those whoever uses those computers now start logging in with their atrium credentials. Um, so they're kind of doing a team by team. And, I, and that's a relatively small hospital. And I think they they started that in August. And I think they're hoping to be done by Thanksgiving. So something like that that they're rolling through. Um, but they, they didn't have an existing SharePoint environment, so I don't know. The one in Georgia that they're looking or in talks with, uh, I think they're going to be a little bit bigger, so I could, be, I could have a better answer here from our teachers. The one thing that I, I didn't get to get into was uh, the name change. Um, pick your, your tenant names very wisely because it is a complete pain to try and change that name because it is baked in everywhere. Um, for us, our our UPNs, our login names, is at Carolinas, uh, and they, they want to change that to at Atrium. So, you know, the Office 365 is a completely different user for SharePoint. Uh, the, the addresses to your OneDrive sites will change uh, based on that alone. Then if you change, you know, SharePoint addresses are tenantname.sharepoint.com. So all of those are going to change. So you saw the numbers. When we do that change, it's going to change the, the address of 20 million documents or 25 terabytes of data. Nine, so you're yeah. trading very carefully. Can you not use aliases when you do it? No. In fact, it, it's it's hardcore baked into the, the office desktop app. Yeah. That's the thing we're trying to figure out is how to make it less impactful on the end user. So when they come in, it's just kind of done. We, we did some testing counts and it wasn't pretty. All right. Well, thank you.